Hello, and welcome back to another edition of News Nightly. The way laws are passed and proposed has never really been the most simple topic to understand. Many citizens today are unaware or just not really educated on the caveats and roadblocks that a proposed bill must pass in order for it to be ultimately enforced. On tonight's edition of News Nightly, our top journalist Mr. Eyre will dissect the process and shine some light on this seemingly shady topic. Let's go over to him. How's it going over there, Mr. Eyre? Thanks, Hobby. As America has grown larger and larger over the past couple of centuries, it seems as if the reach of intergovernmental legislative information has roughly remained the same, leaving people like you and me, or really any other average citizen, in the dark or really clueless about how laws come to be. The first and most important step in creating a new law is having an idea or finding an issue in your community which you would like to see fixed. This could be something as trivial as getting a few new motor laws around your city, or could be something as big as raising the drinking age nationwide. The idea at the local level is passed up to the House of Representatives or the Senator for your state, at which point the representative or the Senator submit the bill to be reviewed by committees. Proposed bills typically become widespread and maintain their relevancy due to their large backings, which are usually made up of interest groups which is an assembly of people with a common interest in mind, or their lobbyists, and, as strange as it may sound, other politicians. This support is crucial, as it seems that the leading cause of death for proposed bills is loss of urgency and attention. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, what's a lobbyist? Well, simple as this. A lobbyist is a person that makes contact with public officials to sway their actions and opinions in regards to legislation typically former politicians themselves, the majority of the time, these individuals use money to get their way. Now that the bill has gone to either of the legislative branch's chambers, the true deliberation begins. After being reviewed, the bill is passed onto a committee or committees based on the characteristics and nature. This marks the beginning of the bill's true journey up the steps of legislation. Committees within the branch are to analyze and make sure it's fit to be sent to other branches or not. There are three things that occur when a proposal is in the hands of a committee. One, the bill is voted on positively by the majority of the committee or committees. Two, the bill is suspended to be heard at a later time. You gotta note, this is where a lot of bills end up. Bill limbo. And three, the bill is rejected and tossed out. Fun fact, if a member of the house calls for the bill to no longer be sent to a committee they deem to be a little too anti, bill, a discharge petition can be called. This petition mainly serves to pressure the particular committee that the bill isn't being approved by, and effectively shows the support that other people may have in favor of it. This is also because these discharge petitions typically don't go through either. Well, let's say you've gone past the committees. Now what? Well, it seems like the time has come for both chambers to discuss the bill themselves. However, the key difference is that instead of the bill itself being scrutinized and analyzed, it is instead judged based on what the representatives or House members think it would cause to occur, typically acting in the interest of the people they represent. If a bill has opposition from another political party or another interest group with a senator up their sleeve, a filibuster may be enacted. In this progress halting event, a senator takes advantage of the unlimited debate rule, as well as the talking floor and delays progress on the bill for as long as possible. Although it is possible to stop a filibuster with a vote of closure, getting three-fifths of the Senate to stop the filibuster can be a very difficult accomplishment. We gotta remember, three-fifths of the Senate is both Republicans and Democrats. Let's say that by some grace of God, your bill isn't filibustered or is turned down by the Senate or the House of Representatives. What now? All that's left is for it to be approved by the Supreme Court and the president. These last two stages of creating a law still do pose many challenges. In the meantime, let's look at some local residents and ask them what they know about law creation. So, what do you know about the creation of laws? Laws shouldn't be created by textbook people, it should be created by the citizens themselves with unity within the community and therefore we'd all agree upon everything that we have to abide by. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. Now, what do you think about politicians being paid to create laws? I think politicians shouldn't get paid to do anything because look at how this world is today in 2020. What have they done? It doesn't look like they've done much. It looks like they've been doing harm more than good. 
And if politicians won't make this world sustain, humble people with unity within the community, like I said, will make this world sustain. Not politicians. Like, I don't agree with any politician. Well, that's absolutely true. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Mr. Greg. Really appreciate it. Before we leave the legislative branch, we have to take a look at the various factors that congressmen and congresswomen have to face when deciding to vote yes or no on a bill. Now, when I say the issues that a congressman or woman may face when voting for a certain bill, I specifically mean how it might affect them in the future of their career. Because of the citizen's ability to vote, we are able to remove any politician we don't deem fit. And this is also connecting to the reason why incumbent candidates tend to win more often than new ones do. If you're wondering what an incumbent candidate is, in short, it's a politician that's already been elected and is running again. These politicians have proven to be able to please the people, do what they're told to, and make good decisions. Whereas new candidates, we're not exactly sure how they function. We don't really know what they're going to do until they're in office. Obviously, this is not set. Obviously, not everyone gets elected twice. However, it is still a big factor. Let's say your bill finally gets out of the legislative branch. Where are we now? Well, the judicial branch is fairly easy to explain. If the judicial branch finds that your piece of legislation is unconstitutional, it will simply be rejected. If it is found to be constitutional, it will be passed. Remember that the Supreme Court judges have to keep this constitutional. That's their whole job, especially when it comes to passing laws. Other issues, it might vary, but that is the core value when passing a law. It must be constitutional, it must not infringe on any basic rights, and it must make sense. Finally, the president. One of two major things can happen. He can A, sign the bill, or B, veto it. When a bill is vetoed by the president, it gets shut down, gets sent back, and he doesn't have to deal with it. On a side note, the president does have a bit of a special ability. He can sign executive orders, which is effectively kind of like small laws that are put into place immediately after him signing it. These executive orders are subject to the same scrutiny as any other law could be. It can be ruled unconstitutional by the judicial branch and be rejected in a vote by the legislative branch. Like Mr. Gary implied earlier, we the citizens should be the ones in control of the government. It is important for us to vote, it is important for us to choose our candidates, and it is important for us to keep a close eye on everything the government does. That's all I've got for tonight. Back to you, Mr. Hobby. Thanks, Mr. Ayer. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us on tonight's episode of News Nightly. Um, yeah.